What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Yogi Misfit Sessions. It's Danny Pomploon here, and I'm coming in hot. We are back at it today with the Fierce Calm collaboration episode, and I got to talk to my sister friend, Gianna. Um, it's so cool because we just, it was our first time talking and I absolutely just fell in love with her and was like, you're awesome and you're amazing. And we're bringing her back on the show, um, to do another Yogi Misfit sessions. Um, don't be a fierce calm, uh, collab this time, but, uh, yeah, we're going to do a show together on some, uh, some other stuff. We'll talk about queer yoga and whatnot. Uh, this episode is, however, a Fierce Calm story, so I'm so excited to share. Um, if you guys haven't checked out Fierce Calm, please go check them out. They're uh, Fierce Calm on Instagram. You can check out their website, FierceCalm.com, and we'll leave the links below. It's awesome, amazing, inspiring stories about how yoga has saved and changed people's lives. And yeah, they're just doing some really great stuff over there. They're spreading the good word all throughout, and we need more of that these days. Um, I want to remind you guys, leave a review on iTunes. It allows us the time and space to share these stories. Um, the more the uh, show gets bumped up the ranks, the better it is for everyone listening and uh, the more listeners that we actually get from it. And last but not least, I'd like to thank my friends over at SF Yoga Mag for all their continued love and support. And for all you listeners out there, I wanted to remind you that I am giving away a five-week arm balancing course. Yep, it's all free. It's five weeks. You get to keep all the courses. You get cool tips and tricks on uh, how to work your arm balances. And yeah, it's just my gift to you for being a listener of the show. You can sign up for that for free at www.dannypomploon.com forward slash email, and you will get the five courses So uh, enjoy them. It is my little gift to you guys for being so awesome. Hope you guys are having a great summer. Here comes the Fierce Calm collab. Gianna, these are some of my favorite podcast episodes um, because I love to hear people's uh, yoga save my life stories. So welcome to the show. Thanks. So glad to be here. Yeah. How's uh, Monday treating you so far? Uh, not bad. I met up with a friend early morning for a Mysore practice and we rode the motorcycle to get downtown and, you know, hanging out around Chicago. And now I'm at my sister's. So Mondays are great. Casual motorcycle riding on a Monday morning. I love it. Yeah. Super easy. (laughs) So I want to hear, I mean, as per usual, we just dive on in. I'd love to hear about your story, your yoga journey and uh, your first calm story. Sure. Um, it's an interesting, it's like yoga saved my life. And then it kind of sounds like now I do yoga all the time and like I'm supposed to be saved or something, but sure, yeah, (laughs) yoga just like continues to blow me away and save my life in so many ways. So yeah, I'm going to try and keep kind of a timeline for you, but, um, just a little backstory before I started yoga, I was suffering from uh, depression and eating disorders. I was suicidal. I had a suicide attempt at 18. I was on um, antidepressants. I was on sleeping pills. I was on Adderall and just kind of like medicating my way through life. Um, I had a lot of anger and resentment. And um, I grew up in a family that was not very good at talking to each Mm. other and communicating. And I also grew up with a sick parent. So um, my mother had Huntington's disease, which is a neurological disease, uh, runs in the family. Her father passed from it. Her siblings all had it. And when you don't talk about something like that, when you're when you know it exists in your family at a young age, it's very confusing. And um, especially uh, I had a definite case of middle child syndrome and mm-hmm. also wasn't really addressing kind of my, my um, familial karma and mm-hmm. uh, was just like angry and confused and emotional. And I had just a hard time. I had a hard time growing up really. And, um, 
I found the practice after I'm, I'm really super lucky to, I, I finished uh, high school and beauty school at the same time. I started working behind the chair super young and uh, I was in a bunch of pain and a client of mine was like, you know, I had back pain and joint pain too. You should go to this yoga stuff. And that's how I started practicing <laughs> this yoga stuff. Yeah, I was like, okay, whatever you say, lady. Um, but yeah, I started practicing and right away noticed a difference in my pain. And the changes that came to me after that were like, I really didn't even know they were happening while they were happening. Um, mm. I, at some point just stopped. I just, I don't recommend this. I'm absolutely, absolutely not an advocate to, um, helping people get off of or just stopping their antidepressants or anything like that. But I just, I just stopped. I, um, I changed my diet completely. I changed my schedule completely. I got out of a super abusive relationship and I just, um, I stopped taking all the pharmaceuticals I was on and just feel really lucky to have a dedicate to have had the dedication to my practice to be able to do that by myself. Um, Mm-hmm. Again, I don't know that that was the safest route. I had a lot of withdrawals that, again, I didn't even know what mm-hmm. what they were. But um, looking back, I'm like, oh, wow, that was pretty intense. Um, right, right, right. Yeah, so I started basically being able to really look at myself and communicate my emotions and see them. And then at the same time, I was really battling with my sexuality, my um, the really abusive first long-term relationship I was in was with a woman. And I, um, when that was over, was like, you know, what am I doing? Is this what a, a lesbian lifestyle is? Just like abusive emotional relationships, which is not the case. People are abusive. Genders aren't abusive. And right, I didn't, right. I didn't understand any of that. I had a hard time understanding my own gender identity. And um, it really just kind of helped me see myself and tune into myself and then start being able to love myself because I, I don't know how I'm, I feel like I'm getting better at being a compassionate person, but sure. it's, it's harder to love someone when you don't know them. So how are you supposed to love yeah. yourself when you don't even know yourself? So that was, right. that, totally. that was one of the big deals for me. And once I started really figuring out how to listen to myself and see myself, my, my truth and my needs and why I am the way that I am and how I can help myself in that situation and in that life be the better me and see me and be seen. Um, what do you think were some of like the, the major things that really, you know, you said it wasn't until you started to see yourself and, and know yourself. Well, when you, let's unpack, I mean, if I can unpack that with you a little bit here, like what really got you to experience that or to see your, to, you know, you know, see yourself, like what did you do to, to get to that point or what tools, techniques did you use? I think I, it was more so the community that I was a part of. Um, I started practicing yoga in Chicago. I was, um, this was what 15 years ago now. And I was very untrusting of the people that I came in contact with. I was very reserved and the studio allowed me a space to just be cracked open and trust. Mm -hmm. And so I never felt in that space while I was really decongesting the pain that was in my body. I never felt like Mm -hmm. I was unsafe to to be whoever I was. So this, this, the teachers were talking to me and they were, you know, I would say something about, um, a person I was seeing, or there'd be like another, um, I had, I never saw any, uh, lesbian teachers or people that looked like, or felt like me. I was always gay men. And, um, that, that made me comfortable, but also I was like, where is, does yoga not, look like me. So there was a little bit of that kind of, um, oh, this is, this is interesting or this is where our, I, I was still at the beginning of my yoga journey. I was still like, I guess I can only find other lesbian people or other queer identifying, um, females or non-binary people in the bars. And so I was still kind mm-hmm. of like, like I would walk my girlfriends to the bar and be like, okay, I have to go home and go to sleep because I have yoga at 6 a.m. Um, 
still there. Like, I still have. At least you walked him there. You know what I mean? <laughs> this is a relationship, right? Yeah, I'll drop you off. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> it was it was it was really just like you know the the teachers that made me be okay with being. Um, feeling like I could talk about what I was going through in my personal life, which is um, if you ever think that becoming a yoga teacher, you're, you're just going to go in and teach a bunch of asana and then go home like, oh, woof. You're yeah. fooled. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. No, <laughs> that shit ain't happening no. anytime if you, soon. If you're really su- <laughs> supplying a brave space, then people are just going to unload, which is amazing. But I remember going into the studio and hearing, I I will never forget it. People were like compassion and like, love yourself. And I was like, what the fuck are you guys (laughs) talking about? Like I just didn't, this language was so so new to me. I was like, I work at a Mm -hmm. gay bar and all we do is talk about drinking, sex and drugs. (laughs) You know what I mean? And then it was like, you know, like you had a problem and you just go get a cocktail and you, you you hang out with your friends and you call it a day. And then I went to yoga and they were like, yeah, let's talk about feelings and things. And I was like, you right. people are fucking weird. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't until later where I was like, oh, this is healthy. This oh, is part I of life. It. And now I feel kind of, <laughs> I feel kind of bad about it. I'm working on it right now. But um, I, I just really dislike small talk. I just don't know. You know, I don't know what, like, yeah. I want to get dirty. I want to talk about the dirty stuff and I want to be challenged. And I think that that definitely sure. started with the the studio that I stepped into. And they weren't like, they weren't putting some sort of yoga teacher face on where they're like, oh, well, all you need is to just really realign all your chakras. And then everything is going to be, they were like, oh right. shit, that's fucking crazy. Oh, sorry. I don't know if you can. Okay. <laughs> but, um, you, can totally you know, they were please. like, they were real people that were working on themselves, that were talking about the good stuff, the bad stuff, the dirty stuff, the taboo things. And I was like, mm. oh, okay. And then I, I kind of started just like, I would say, oh, yeah, my girlfriend, or I'm going on a date with this girl, or mm-hmm. like something like that. And it, it never, mm. I, I never felt weird. Um, I never felt alone. And like, you know, I, I grew up, I come from a big family and nobody, nobody in my school, there was one person that was gay and he got just reamed. They were so mean to him. And that kind of taught me, like I had my first girlfriend when I was 15 and I was like, we have to hide, Mm -hmm. you know, like this, this isn't safe. You can't Mm -hmm. get through school like this, you know? And so once they started seeing me and I could outwardly say, say something with my voice and not even be challenged with a look or a feeling, I was like, oh, this is okay. Like, this isn't a problem. Um, And so that, that accompanying me being out of pain and interested in moving my body and feeling my body and my emotions and feeling them. Uh, that really let me feel like I could be a queer person. Mm, Yeah. I mean, I feel that like I was the only gay person, I mean, outwardly gay person in, uh, in high school as well. And I also started dating really young and this shit was brutal. People are fucking mean. (laughs) There's no way to put it. You know, people are mean and they're not nice and they weren't kind. And I get it, you know, like, you know, we talked about the karma of our, of our family, but they're living the karma of their family. You know, there was all, all the wounds and whatnot just gets passed down and passed down and passed down. But it, right. it's brutal. You don't, you're 15 years old. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to handle someone else's parents' trauma and their pain and their anger and what, like, you you don't know how to intake that. You know what right. I'm saying? Yeah. You're trying to figure your own shit out at 15. I totally, I mean, I, no. I feel it. It's not, it's not easy. It's still not easy, but especially when you're, you know, at least now as, um, you, like, as an older adult or right. as an adult, I should say, <laughs> whatever that means, <laughs> that's a joke in itself, right. but I guess. you know what I mean? we're adults by the way. <laughs> um, but you know, like I, I can still barely, you know, maneuver the world being a right. queer man at, at 35, you know, like it, it, I yeah. only know what was happening. Yeah, at and I, it's kind of cool being in my 30s now and looking back at these different pockets in my life, and I'm like, oh, this is because of that, and that is because of that. Like, I just, I just recently realized that my eating disorder and my issues with my body were because any time that I gained weight as a female-born person, I looked more feminine. 
So I was very uncomfortable v- being very feminine presenting, mm. which I'm, you know, I, I, I just absolutely despise mm-hmm. the, not, the, the binary. I think it's not a thing. And, you know, like studying Hinduism and, and, and um, Tantra and like every God mm-hmm. has is masculine encoded and feminine encoded at different times. And there's the third gender and it's such an old, old thing that all of a sudden we put names in boxes and like everyone needs to know where you fall. So I just don't really like it. I do use she, her pronouns, but um, it's interesting that just feeling or looking more curvy made me uncomfortable because all of a sudden that was what made me more, f- more feminine in the world. So that was, that was like kind of a, a flip for my triggers right. for my yeah, eating for sure. issues. It was just like, this is, this is a fluctuation of the body that I'm in. And how can I recognize that how I'm being presented into the world has nothing to do with the energy that I'm putting out into the world. Right now I am genderless or right now I'm very female. I'm very feminine or I'm very, you know, masculine and coded, maybe not masculine presenting, but you know, just like kind of giving me freedom to be like, this isn't you. This is, this is just stuff and matter and whatever. <laughs> it's literally just, it's literally just <laughs> matter. <laughs> yeah, and it happens to be presented it. in a certain way. I, I, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. There's, there's so much there that I want to get into. And I feel like me and you, me and you should probably do another podcast episode on this stuff just because it's a really good topic, but I would love it, yeah. like, I, I, I'd love like, so you, you started to find this, I mean, there's so much in your story that I'm just like, yes, mm-hmm. uh-huh, the same, right. same, you know, you started to feel the support and have this opportunity to connect and have these conversations and, you know, again, just be able to unpack your shit. What happened after? Um, when we started teaching and sharing and training Asana with one of my teachers and um, just feeling really kind of free in what I was doing. There was a time where I was making $200 a week and living in my truck and I felt the best, you know, it was just like no stuff and things were great. And um, I, in 2013, I was living in Australia and teaching and my father was diagnosed with ALS. And so he was the one that was supposed to be around for my mom. Like my mom had Huntington's. He did everything he could to set her up, to set up his life so he could take care of her. And, you know, he wasn't supposed to get sick. And so he, he's, what a typical dad. He waits until I get to Australia and I start work and things are good to call me and tell me. And he's like, don't come home, do your contract. And then, um, and then we'll see you after. And I kind of talked to my siblings and I did cut my time there a little short, but, um, I went home. Basically I went home, I got engaged, I married my wife and then I moved to Chicago. (laughs) And, um, and I spent a couple years there until in 2015, he passed away in, in September and, um, the, it was a couple days after that, that I, I think it was exactly two days. I went to the city, um, cause he was, he was staying in, in the suburbs at the time. And I was like, I'm going to go do yoga. One of my friends was teaching. I feel really safe there. And, um, I didn't have a helmet or anything with me. So, uh, my wife was on the back and we were going to pick up a helmet so that I could, I could dry, I could ride to go pick up Hawaiian shirts because from uh, my dad's because he, we were all going to wear Hawaiian shirts. He wore Hawaiian shirts all the time. He's just like constantly. That sounds like a great time. I don't know. But, so, so I was like, I should go buy my, <laughs> buy a helmet and, you know, do this long ride. It'll, it'll feel good to just like be outside and on the bike. And, um, I was yeah. going straight towards my friend's shop and somebody turned left and, uh, hit us. And so, that um, this is, you know, everyone's calling each other to tell everyone that my dad had passed and my sister's getting a call saying that I'm uh, in the hospital or or the the two of us are. And so, yeah, she was pissed. Um, It was a big, (laughs) it was a big break in our solidarity as siblings. There's four of us and they were all together and I was away and basically I got a call and, you know, I know she was scared and I know she was angry, but she was like, you're never getting on a bike again. How dare you? It was just like very accusatory. And I was like, I'm going to get off the phone now. Just like hook up to everything. I'd broken my pelvis. My face was covered in blood. Like I was, you know, a mess. 
Um, my wife at the time, she was fine. And she and one of my friends who is a best friend of mine, he was living um, in Oregon at the time. He flew in and he went straight to the hospital because he was coming in for my my dad's passing. And uh, he ended up just coming in to help take care of me. So I'm super grateful for that. And also really grateful. Like my, my dad had a, a hospital set up at the house. It was like a, a hospital bed and, you know, all sorts of things I ended up needing. Um, I tr- checked myself out early. Uh, they rolled me up to uh, his, the site of his funeral and I could, I could barely, I mean, I was in so much pain. They, they could barely keep me there. So, um, he, yeah, he like, um, just, he, it was, it was a really beautiful space. It was a beautiful time to like, just kind of sit back and witness. I was on so many painkillers and drugs and stuff like that, that I, I, I don't remember a lot of it, but um, I basically had been training for asana right before that my body, I was doing just a lot of breath work and meditation and I had no internal bleeding. They were like, just so amazed by me. I started walk. I could stand by myself again, 10 days after that. I, um, started walking and, uh, went to a hot yoga class two weeks after that and just stood there. I had like my walker and my crutches and my, and just just was breathing with everyone and just being in the space where people do the same work, even though it looked different on my body, I, I started to heal. And what was really fascinating was what people, what changed in me, people would come up to me and they'd be like, Oh, um, did you stretch too far or something? What's wrong? And I'm like, no, I like let's hit on a motorcycle. That doesn't happen in yoga. You don't break your pelvis. They're like, you know, I felt I had a hangnail today and I wasn't sure if I was going to come. And I was, it just kind of hit me like pain is pain and it registers differently for everyone. But when you're in pain, there's, that is your focus. And if I could just use my practice and help others use their practice to get out of whatever degree of pain they're in, then that is that is what I'm doing here. That is why I'm here. And that's why I needed to go through that experience uh, because I'm 100% more compassionate for it, a better teacher for it, and more understanding of those who are post surgery and who have broken their wrists or have soft tissue damage in their joints or, um, you know, can't go upside down because of vertigo or something. You know, people that have had to learn to walk again and are just trying to balance on one leg. Like, you think you can just teach people to do this and they'll just get it if you've never actually struggled with it yourself, which starting, you know, I started yoga when I was 18. Like I had a very able body at the time, so I could just try all the things and then get all the things. But, you know, I had the opportunity to feel old, to feel broken, to feel, uh, you know, all like my body in a totally different light. So um, yoga, it was fascinating. It was the perfect study. And one of my friends, he's really an interesting human, uh, came in to visit me in the hospital and he was like, you look just amazing right now. And I was like, thank you. And I didn't, it was probably the first time that I never questioned that comment. He was like, you're so beautiful. And I, I, I would usually be like, oh no, stop. Or God, I look gross. There's something horrible. And I was like, my eyes felt wide. Like I felt like I could see everything and everyone. So, you know, that's like just another way that yoga saved me. And then in 2018, I divorced my wife. We were together for 10 years. Um, I went to, I take people to India every year. And so I, I left for India and I get a call from my sister saying that they're taking my mom off hospice and I should come home. So I, I had such a great crew. They were such beautiful humans. I um, I left India early. That just a few days, they they had a great time um, with and without me. And I came home and sat with my mom as she was passing. And it was really is just really fascinating to lose everything. Like I lost my one main support system. Um, my my 
I just, you know, still love that person so much. She's just really uh, one of my favorite humans. And, but I, I lost her and her family who became my whole world. They were like my able-bodied parents. And I lost my home. I lost my cat. I lost our car, you know, and I was all of a sudden like, what am I? <laughs> it was like refiguring out myself again. And to do that in your thirties is such a gift because I think naturally you do that when you like get out of your twenties, you're like, you know, you're, you're starting to move out of your, uh, your just return to Saturn and like your kind of dependent issues on different things were well, me, I guess, but, um, everything. and then, and then to really literally lose everything. It's like, okay, now I and, um, you know, to just sit with my mom while she was passing was just so put things in such perfect perspective to me, where I would have never been able to do this if I wasn't a practicing yogi. But I it was so insignificant, so many of the things and the stuff. And again, the matter, it's like su- it's such whatever, like her body, her body stayed for a little longer than her spirit. Like I could feel her spirit leave her. And, you know, there was this really in, intense happening as she was passing where her breath changed and she cried and then it was, it, it stopped. And just like the breath, the body was still passing, but she was gone. And it was, it, it looked like a lot, but it was peace. And to just feel like this is it. I'm with all of my siblings for the first time in however long we are, we have a, a home that we are safe under we have each other we kind of it really felt like we uh, gave a hug around our relationship again and we were just back together because we were holding space for the passing of the person together, who brought yeah, us wow. here. <laughs> and, yeah, and it was just like this this is safe and this is it and we have such little time here that why would we attach to all of our struggles and our stories oh i'm divorced oh i'm queer oh what am i am i a, a female or am i like they still are our stories and they're necessary to life but you don't have to live those stories because there's so much more to see and feel that is beyond the tangible form mm. And it was just really special to be so clear and to be able to be present because I wasn't in pain and I wasn't emotionally distraught with my own shit that I could just be there for that. And that totally paved my path. I was like, oh, this is, I am not doing a single thing anymore if it has nothing to do with love. And so... That's incredible. I'm, <laughs> I'm like sitting over here. I, I feel like I need a box of tissues right now. <laughs> um, it was fat. It was, it was just fascinating. And, you know, I, I, I really, it, there's so many factors and people along this path that have made that be a, a possibility for me in this time. But if I wasn't practicing yoga and every day and making a living every day to work on myself and help others do the same, I don't know that I could come to these realizations now. I mean, totally. It gets you out of your own way. It gets you out of your own shit. And to be able to, you know, witness, witness, not judge, but witness somebody else go through, it gives you a little more perspective exactly. as well. That's incredible, man. I feel like we we really do need to do two more podcast episodes, like based on everything that we've talked about. There's one on your story, the one about queer people, and then the one about getting out of we our own shit. To, we've got, yeah, we got shit to do. Out. It's done. Yes. <laughs> I'm down. I'm totally down. John, I can't thank you enough for, uh, for, I just love hearing these stories, man. They're so incredible. And I'm so happy I'm dialed in with Fierce Calm. And, and they're just such a great platform. And because now I get, now I have a new friend exactly. like you. And yeah, this is amazing. Totally. Super cool. <laughs> Thanks for coming yeah. on the show today and, and sharing your story and your wisdom. And I, I just appreciate it so, so much. And who knows, let's see what we it. come up with next. Thanks. And in the final section of the show, we're going to share some stories from other members of the Fierce Calm tribe. And first up, we got Nicole. Hi, everybody. 
Um, I'm going to share a little bit about um, my story. I think sometimes it's uh, hard to um, put into words uh, your lifetime up to this point, um, but I'll do my best to summarize the key points and the impact that yoga has had on my life. So if I go back all the way to my youth growing up, um, I remember feeling different. And there was this need to be seen and to be validated by outside sources um, other than myself. So I sought out perfection, I strived in school um, as an athlete, and there still was this um, emptiness inside of me. And that uh, need to be seen and validated um, spiraled into um, this uh, lack of self-love and need to control because I felt so uh, out of control on the inside. So that uh, led to development of an eating disorder. So at the age of 13, I became bulimic. And for those of you that are not aware of it, the spectrum in terms of bulimia is um, different from one person to another. But um, I purged. Um, and to be honest, I don't have a recollection of how many times per day because um, your mind gets consumed by food, your scheduling, uh, the need to get rid of the food, and a lot of it becomes a blur. So I actually was sick from 13 till 25 years old. And during that time, my um, bulimia spiraled into exercise bulimia, which is uh, not only purging, but and then any time I ate, there was a desperate need to get rid of my calories that were consumed through exercise. So that became um, quite addictive. Um, an obsession with uh, cardio and need to burn off everything. And at the root of all that, there was this obvious lack of um, self-worth and self-hate that uh, dominated it. And I was in, under its grip for a really, really long time. And um, on top of that, as I entered into my um, early 20s, I was in uh, my first relationship and um, it was quite verbally abusive and unhealthy for me. And I decided to break away from it and take my first trip to uh, Europe with a girlfriend at the time. And while I was away, um, I was raped. So um, I get choked up every time I even say that. And I don't think um, anyone has the capacity to um, heal that or um, wrap their mind around how to cope. So uh, my... Uh, need to control food uh, became worse, um, drugs and alcohol, um, very unhealthy choices, and I spiraled into a really dark place. Um, a few years after that, in my early 20s, let's say probably around uh, 23, 24, I tried my first yoga class. And um, people today always ask me, why do I do so much yoga? And the truth is, it really, um, it saved me and it gave me a second chance at life. So now 36, and since that first class, I haven't stopped, and I've been doing a class ever since. And um, it actually is how I live and breathe my every day. I um, became a physical education teacher, and I went on to pursue several yoga trainings. And the last decade or so has been my journey towards self-discovery, uh, discovering who I am at the root, and building day by day more self-love and honoring the soul that I am and the person that I am and who I'm meant to be in this world. And it's really yoga that allowed me that opportunity. I'm incredibly grateful for the practice. Um, it taught me kindness, compassion, love, appreciation, patience, and that I'm worthy. And um, today I share my passion with the world and I'm at a place where I've healed a lot of those deep wounds. And even though it is an endless journey and there's so much more work to do, I'm at a place where I can um, use those traumas and those experiences to help others. And that's what I do through my retreats, through my classes, through my events. And I'm incredibly grateful uh, to be here and to have the capacity to pass those messages on. Um, my theory in teaching is actually lean into your edges. And it's 
the idea that when we lean into those areas of discomfort, the places where we tend to shy away from, uh, that's where the magic is. And uh, when I started to look into my wounds, look into the darkness, and look into the areas that kept me, kept me in shame and in guilt, that's when I set myself free. So incredibly grateful for yoga. It truly did save my life. And um, I'm so grateful that I stepped on my mat and it brought me right here. And lastly, we have Robin. 15 years ago today, I woke up from a coma in the intensive care unit of William Beaumont Hospital. I'd been lying there for four days on a ventilator, nearly lifeless, after an intentional drug overdose that was meant to end my life. When suddenly, to my and everyone else's surprise, I woke up, wide awake. My first thoughts were pretty awful. I was consumed with anger, fear, and mind-crippling confusion. And the pain I'd been desperately trying to escape seemed more powerful than ever. In fact, for the first year that followed this incident, most of my thoughts and feelings weren't positive, not even close. I was just trying to survive myself long enough to come into some deeper healing, and most days wasn't even sure I really wanted to make it. It would be a very long road. Treatment, meetings, new associations, new behaviors, new everything. At times I felt dizzying bewilderment. No matter how hard it got though, there was one persistent thought that kept me hanging in there. One idea that resonated as unshakable truth. Maybe I was here to do something. Despite my greatest attempts to die, somehow I managed to survive this horrific experience. Doctors said they had no explanation, that medically speaking, my survival didn't make sense. So what if maybe, just maybe, there was something more for me to do here? This curiosity began to fan the flames of my recovery and still does to this day. I found yoga and very slowly began to develop a practice. Yoga has truly saved me from myself. Through the practices of yoga and meditation, I'm no longer a prisoner to my doubts, fears, cravings, and aversions. One day, one breath at a time, I've been able to learn from my mistakes, make amends, and begin again. As I stood in sacred space this morning, remembering my awakening from death's grip, I've never felt more grateful to be here, alive and free, living with purpose and sharing this healing with others. My prayer is thank you. Just a big thank you to Gian and Nicole and Robin for sharing their stories today. It's so important that we continue to share our journeys so that we can all inspire one another and empower one another. It also takes the shame out of all of it as well. So thank you guys for taking uh, the time and, and sharing your courage and strength. And until the next Yogi Mes Misfit Sessions, I almost forgot how to say my own show. This is Danny saying peace out.